Hello, everyone. My name is Uber. Uh, we are five minutes, five minutes uh, behind schedule, so simple introduction is enough. Uh, we will be presenting uh, what public-private partnership is, and some call it public-private integration, some call it public-private mix, some call it public-private partnership. Uh, just a brief introduction into it, what exactly it is, and then we'll be moving towards a uh, presentation from two two of our country implementation. One is Sri Lanka and other is Pakistan. So let's uh, quickly jump into it, what exactly it is. Uh, as name suggests, like it's uh, it's an approach where you combine the public and private sector in order to leverage the uh, strengths of both sectors and um, try to provide uniform services and uh, like good quality care to people who actually need it. Uh, particularly important when um, the private sector, like in Pakistan, I can give an example. Most of the services are provided by private sector, let's suppose in TB. So then if they're not being reported into the national system, then that makes public private sector implementation very important. And the other scenario is like when there are a lot of public providers, but they are not reporting their data to national system. So this is also the case when the public-private implementation becomes very important. Uh, there are the advantages. Uh, of course, wider coverage. You 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 successfully reach a more number of people they, who need services. Um, and then uh, now in this comes the strength from both public sector have their own strengths, private sector have their own. So we try to leverage both of them and come up with some uh, some system that provides uniform services. Uh, it is effective use of resources, as I suggested, strength from both technical capacity from uh, public sector and uh, uh, physical infrastructure from private structure, they can combine and come up with better services. Uh, challenges. Um, challenges are something which we have actually learned from uh, our implementation that we have been involved in, in Pakistan. Some of the discussion we will be having from public sector, uh, from ministry and other from the private sector, we have colleagues are sitting here, so they will get more into detail. But the but after involvement in the project, uh, some challenges that we have seen probably not very much technical, but uh, often the technical challenges are not hard to get a hand on. So the, the same is the case in uh, public private uh, partnership, uh, like legal and regulatory framework. Uh, which, as its name suggests, there has to be some MOU between both institutes so that they know who is going to be responsible for what. There's a clear roles and responsibilities, plan of action, what needs to be provided at the end of the day, and who will, who will be responsible for carrying out the services. Uh, there are sharing agreement. Uh, of course, if the single system is going to be used for both public and private, then there has to be a clear understanding that uh, how the data will be shared between two institutes, uh, public and the private. So this collaboration has to be there from the day one. This understanding has to be there from the day one. It's not that it's, this is not something they can leave it for the later stages. Okay, we'll deal with it later on now. It will not work. They, they first have to have this understanding that how they are going to manage data sharing agreements. And this is probably, I think, we have just uh, done as well in our case. Change request management, when you are working with a simple single system for both, public and private, public and private both have different data flows. Private sector wants to do some extra stuff, which public sector probably not. So in that case, to, to make sure that data flows of the public and private sector are not, not being disturbed by the changes done in the system, they have to have some kind of agreement uh, that will make sure that the changes are being done to the system are consistent, and it's not that public sector is doing changes which make which makes completely uh, which makes private sector completely uh, unable to work on their domain or the private sector changes which makes completely 
uh, unacceptable for pub- public sector. So this this communication has to be very much coordinated, and there has to be some solid framework that manage this change request. Some SOPs has to be there. Who is following what? Who is responsible for what? And uh, in our case, like uh, it's it's better to have a core team which consists of both from public sector and the private sector. So that's that's the key, one of the key that they can do in order to achieve this change request management. Uh, some key that we have actually uh, figured out in our project, of course, uh, trust is the first thing because then uh, both sector will be having some access to uh, the data. So probably this uh, trust factor should be there. Political will, as I suggested, the technical issues are not the one which are difficult. It's more of the managerial stuff. Access to substantial frame, uh, financial support and continuous material input, which is important for sustainability. Uh, they they need to have a consistent source of funding. It's not like they have for two for two years unless they will be taken care of later on. Uh, training for both health providers involved, establishing joint monitoring and evaluation. Like after some time, they have to evaluate that how far this has been successful and if there are changes needed they need to do it like in our case we have pilot we have we have, we have been consistently going through the pilot evaluation through the srs uh, abdullah my colleague will uh, will be saying more about srs the sub recipients so we have their evalu- we have their inputs and we keep on changing our system for the good uh yes building capacity of the private healthcare. And this is where like public sector can help because uh, they can provide capacity building, especially when they are hosting as well, because it's 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 a it's a it's a data belong the data belongs to ministries, so they will be holding the system. So definitely uh ownership is there, but uh, uh they, they need to have capacity as well so that they, they can train private sector people as well if they want to work with the system. Uh, I am. I don't have much to say now, and I think our next uh, uh, presentation is from Sri Lanka. Uh, Doctor, I forgot the name. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Doctor. Doctor Yeah. Yes. So we have a colleague from Sri Lanka. Um, Shall I share my screen or? Uh, we have it here now. So you just carry on. Uh, just let me know when you want to move on and I'll be moving on with it. Okay. Okay. So uh, let me start. So um, good evening. Uh, I'm Dr. Udayanga, Yapa Bandara, attached to the Family Health Bureau, Ministry of Health Sri Lanka. And today I'll be presenting to you about capturing maternal and newborn health data for private health sector institutions in Sri Lanka. Next slide. Oh, and uh, the contents of this presentation will be composed of introduction, objective, case study, lessons learned, and output and outcome. Next slide. Uh, despite the childbirths occurring in both the public and private sectors, only data relevant to live births in public health sector is available due to the absence of a proper mechanism to capture births that are occurring in private health health hospitals. 99% of the births occurring in Sri Lanka are institutional deliveries, according to the annual report of Family Health Bureau, Ministry of Health, and annual health bulletin of the Medical Statistics Unit of Ministry of Health. So according to the uh, Registrar General's Department, uh, the total number of live births for 2022 was 275, uh, 321, which comprises of deliveries occurring in the private sector and the government sectors. Next slide. So uh, this is uh, the provinces of Sri Lanka. So Sri Lanka has nine provinces, and from the survey conducted in 2020 by the Family Health Bureau, the data pertaining to births were obtained from the relevant provinces of the private health uh, hosp- private sector hospitals. The data collected revealed the private health sector deliveries from the nine provinces were as follows, but there was no proper mechanism in place to capture the number of live births occurring in the private sector. Next slide. It was identified that the non-availability of a proper system to capture the maternal and child health data 
from the private sector was a drawback in the national program. So therefore, in 2019, uh, the Electronic Reproductive Health Management Information System tool for health institutions uh, was launched using event capture system uh, uh, for healthcare institutions, which initiated a pilot uh, in the major private sector hospitals of Western province in Sri Lanka. So the, as the initial project was a success, it was decided to expand the system island-wide by 2023. Uh, next slide. So uh, the objective of the study was to capture all deliveries happening in private health institutions in Sri Lanka and to collect information on essential maternal newborn health indicators for the country. Uh, next slide. So uh, a minimal data set was identified following several rounds of focus group discussions and in-depth interviews among stakeholders. Uh, DHIS to base event capture system was developed based on the minimal data set. And for maternal death reporting and neonatal death reporting, we used ICDCM and ICDPM classification codes uh, were used in the system. Trainings were conducted for identified users in each private hospital on data entry and visualization. And a partnership was developed between the Ministry of Health Sri Lanka and private hospitals of Sri Lanka, which facilitated the entire process, which was mutually beneficial. Next slide, please. Uh, in terms of data flow, uh, uh, we can see here that the private sector and the public sector, uh, we obtain delivery uh, pertaining to uh, um, uh, deliveries that occur in the private hospitals, you know, death data and metal data from private sector. Uh, then uh, after we obtain the data, we give feedback to the private sector. Next slide, please. And uh, initially, uh, uh, the first uh, lesson we learned was planning and preparation. So adequate planning and preparation are crucial before deploying the and uh, here health management information system. So it is essential to assess the needs of the healthcare facility, involve relevant stakeholders, and develop a detailed implementation plan. So uh, secondly, user involvement and training. So engaging end users from the beginning and providing a comprehensive training and training are essential and users should be involved in system design, testing, decision-making process to ensure their needs are met. So um, in terms of uh, data quality and standardization, so establishing a data quality standards and ensuring data standardization is essential for effective data management. Clear guidance should be provided to healthcare workers regarding data entry, coding, and validation. So when it comes to infrastructure and technical support, sufficient technical infrastructure, including hardware, software, and net networking capabilities is necessary for the successful implementation of a health management information system. So uh, adequate technical support should be available to address any technical issues that may arise. So um, change management and leadership, deploying, a uh, health management information system often requires a significant organizational and workflow changes. Effective change management strategies, including clear communication, training, leadership support, are crucial to overcome resistance and ensure smooth adoption. So the sustainability and scalability, uh, in terms of sustainability and scalability, consideration should be given to the long-term sustainability and scalability of the health management information system. This includes financial planning, maintenance, regular systems updates, and the ability to accommodate future growth and evolving needs. So continuous monitoring and evaluation, regular monitoring and evaluation of the health management information system implementation are vital to identify areas of improvement and measure the system's effectiveness and make necessary adjustments to optimize its performance. So last but not least, data security and privacy. So uh, ensuring data security and privacy is utmost importance in a health management information system. A robust security measures, including user access controls, encryption, adherence to privacy regulations must be in place to protect sensitive patient information. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, and the outputs and outcome we, we found was the electronic system reports all deliveries taking place in private healthcare institutions of the Ministry of Health, and it provides a comprehensive set of information for the country in order to manage a national maternal newborn health program in Sri Lanka by adhering to the national guidelines. Private sector hospitals are being 
benefited by training they received from the government sectors and electronic reproductive health management information system too will play a, a role in obtaining a clear representation of how much the private sector rep represents compared to public sector in Sri Lanka. And uh, we, we created dashboards based on their, their, their private sector request are made available for them uh, to visualize and monitor their maternally born health services through the system. And uh, this, uh, next slide, please. Um, this, these are some dashboards we created um, from the private sector, uh, for the private sector uh, and uh, our institution. Uh, could you click the next slide? Uh, which is another one. And uh, there's another slide. So, okay. So these are some dashboards we uh, uh, created, obtaining the data from the private sector. And uh, uh, last but not least, uh, why we need DHIS2 as a platform to collect this data. So why DHIS2? So DHIS2 is, as we all know, is a free open source software that is suited for the current economy of Sri Lanka. And uh, it's a user-friendly, easily customizable system to meet the stakeholders' needs. And uh, as you all know that uh, DHIS2 is already implemented in Sri Lanka and the people uh, in the ministry uh, are really um, well organized and uh, used to uh, using the system. And uh, um, other thing is that uh, it's a big uh, data warehouse we, which we use for research uh, and compiling annual reports and innovation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now we, uh, I request the Public Sector Ministry of Health, uh, Sir Mustafa Jamal Ghazi. Are you still with us or you left? Um, I'm open to any questions. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm with you. Great. Good evening, everyone. So, uh, thank you. Let me just start the presentation. No, no, not this one. Not this one. Uh, this one. Yes. Yeah, we can ask the question at the end. Please, thank you. Sir, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and good evening. Uh, this is Mustafa Jamal Kazi. I'm a joint secretary in the Ministry of Health and national coordinator for Common Management Unit funded by the Global Fund. Uh, hello to everyone, and uh, uh, I hope you must be enjoying the Oslo weather. Uh, but here in Pakistan, it's very hot. So uh, let me uh, uh, introduce what I wanted to convey to all of uh, the technical team who are into the very noble cause of this uh, eradication and stop TB. And this is what DHIS2 people are doing a wonderful job. And as far as the Oslo University is concerned, they are keep on engaging us and keep on asking the demands and the uh, necessary changes with regard to the uh, proper, you know, a dashboard to be generated. Next. Uh, this is the current situation. Uh, well, uh, the uh, there was a little issue with regard to the co-sharing of uh, the government of Pakistan with regard to these three diseases. But now the government of Pakistan has contributed around 2 billion rupees in order to, you know, more uh, injectize the entire interventions. Next. These are the present challenges. Uh, the challenge is the scale of HIV AIDS TB prevention program is too low to achieve an impact. And low number of people living with HIV AIDS TB are on treatment, high level of stigma and discrimination, weak monitoring and evaluation system, lack of integrated approach across communicable diseases, specifically TB and HIV. HIV is not in development or even on political agenda, but now, 
after you know the uh, global fund has invoked additional safeguard policy it has become a lot of uh, challenges we are facing and this is why we are more emphasizing that this digitalization has become more important more rational so uh, um, let's uh, uh, show you the challenges and how to meet those challenges please go ahead Next, next, next. This is, uh, you see, in every organization, you need to have, uh, you know, proper data to be recorded. Presently in Pakistan, the data has become a very, very difficult task. And how to you know make our assessment and analysis according to the program interventions? We has we have you know facing a lot of challenge as far as the data uh, actualization and authentication is in case of Pakistan. Next, this is the whole. Uh, despite uh, global fund. Uh, uh, Pakistan co-financing, the science of uh, HTM data synergizes and coordination remain highly un underutilized. Now, this is the problem. And this is what the demand of the state of Pakistan right now with the Oslo universities, uh, you know, uh, the experts who are preparing this dashboard, that how it how it is presently working. The patient information not digitized and encrypted, loose records on papers and Excels, Excel files are confidentially, confidentially very risky. And uh, the PR and SRs, data is not talking with each other. This is the main cause of entire you know, uh, problem that whenever we prepare a program review or whenever we start you know, judging ourselves that what to monitor, where to monitor, and how to monitor, and how to engage ourselves to know the value for money. Now, this part is very much missing, that everyone is working under their silos, and the data is not talking with each other. The provincial data, that is the public sector, and the private data, that is the, the partners and supporters with us. The both data are not, not talking with each other. There is some sort of uh, issue of authentication. Again, there is a real-time diagnosis tracking and automated nearby referrals are impossible. Geofencing of testing, treatment, and supply dynamics never recognize despite mapping. Treatment records are not digitized. Therefore, follow-up cannot be automated. Automated follow-up SMS alerts are not systematized and artificial intelligence based just as that, that's, uh, you know, we have a practice in COVID and it's a very successful story in Pakistan with regard to the COVID intervention and the data was, you know, working uh, in the COVID operation was wonderful. So here we are going to have a, a real time data system to be you know talking with each other with each and every public and private interventions or interveners to work on it and again we are actually we have this problem that silos of good pr and sr work but patient data is not linked with the national database therefore state limited actions we can't judge we can't evaluate we can't monitor whatever the pub, uh, private uh, interventionists are doing, what are their targets and what they have achieved so far and how they have achieved so far or whether, whether, whether they have achieved and it has been recorded or it has an impact on the field. It is, it is really a big question for the state of Pakistan to tell each and everything to everyone. A stock and warehouse digitization only exist at the national level. Yes, we have a stock in digitization at the federal government level, but it has to be supposed to be, you know, digitized at the at the provincial level, at the re regional level. Uh, PR and SR centric digital system rather client patient, not a common platform. Again, 
this is a big challenge. Difficult patients access to HDM, HDM services in remote areas. Invisible diagnostic financial support, MIS. Data not leading to geo-specific advocacy communication and, uh, uh, and social mobilization. Therefore, patients and communities are disad at disadvantage. This is the situation when you are completely unaware of what is happening around you. How and where to find out those HIV or TB positive patients and what should be the mapping system. So what we have done so far in order to facilitate the DHIS2 effectively worked on it. That is, we have mapped all the you know, GPs along with the coordinators of their locations and their areas and their districts and their places where they are working for. Still, uh, the public sector's uh, interventionist or public sector's facilities are basically, you know, known to everyone, but the private sector's facilities are, you know, seldomly known to anyone. So now with this sort of, uh, you know, uh, this uh, entire, uh, uh, the problems and challenges faced by the government here in Pakistan, we have suggested a solution. Uh, next. This is multi-stakeholder accountability digital framework. And CMU is committed to state, multi and bilateral synergies. Without this, it is impossible to reach the numbers, to, re to evaluate the targets and to see that how they have been attended, how they have been taken care, what are the level of their taken care and, and, and how the communities are talking with each other along with the, the specialists, the GPs and the program, programmatic uh, officials are talking with each other. Presently, this is a challenge. This is a problem that nobody is here to support them in, as far as the data is concerned. With the inception of uh, DHIS2, I believe I have a discussion with the uh, our team here of DHIS2 in Pakistan, and I have sensitized the issue of how and where to, you know, um, sort of uh, engage our community in order to reach the num reach out to the maximum number of population if they are HIV or TB positive, because. HIV and TB are seg uh, segregatedly being treated and they need to be, you know, integrated. So this is how we believe that the ideal system of engagement with the DHIS2 should be like this, that the patient data, EMR, testing and treatment and supplies. It's a facility where it is available. Number one, number two, a system of national um, you know, database that is the Nadra here in Pakistan, which has you know complete database of national identification and identity cards available in the country. And this is the basically the key key to this success. That even if we we we've lost any patient at any point of time, if we have to digitized through biometrics, definitely that patient is going to be followed time and again through their notifications. Presently, the NADRA system is not in vogue and we need to create a artificial intelligence system to follow that specific person who is declared to be HIV positive. We don't find any big challenge to reach out to the maximum number of pol uh, population, even up to the uh, remotest area. But how to reach, where to reach, this is the problem. And how to suggest them where to go and what facilities it is nearby at, at their you know, location. This is the challenge. So the advisory role the DHIS2 is going to play in Pakistan.
and this is what i am uh, you know emphasizing for this type of uh, software or this type of interventions or digitalization of the uh, activity should be placed on on board so that we can reach out to the maximum number of population again you can see the geofencing and artificial intelligence to guide alert clients and providers to nearest now this is what i am talking of if you can't have a system in the area where the awareness is very weak where the communication with the community is very weak where the, the where the access of the health workers is very 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 weak so in all these uh, you know factors we need to engage as maximum as possible through these data now how to generate the data and how to achieve the data so this is this is the main issue and that is the that can only be you know a proper challenge for us so what i basically feel the diagnostic financing mis integration system that all of them should talk with each other even the public and private as zubair uh, at the uh, very beginning of his own slide that he was emphasizing the public and private synergies should work it with them to work with, with uh, bilaterally working with each other and to talk with each other in this way we can effectively very very effectively you know uh, engage our all activities according to the e diagnostic system and this could be the best possible you know system which can be find out for diagnosis services supplies network optimization is the basically need i thank you here my two slides speaks volume of uh, uh, you know problems and challenges and uh, uh, this is what and if anybody have some question please you, you are welcome thank you sir thank you very much we are taking question at the end and now i would like to call upon our mercy court guys if you can come and I will start from where uh, Mr. Kazi has left uh, the discussion about the challenges Pakistan is facing, especially the private sector. And uh, my topic of discussion is the use of digital system in the private sector. Next slide. So, as uh, Mr. Kazi has mentioned, that Pakistan has been struggling with the setting up the digital system uh, for TB control program in uh, in the country since the very beginning when the program restarted back in two thousand one. But in 2018, with the support of the uh, University of Oslo and His Pakistan, we set up a DHS2 aggregate system in the country. And, uh, and with this system, we actually found the solution of our problem. Uh, as you know, in Pakistan, Pakistan is one of the high, high burden countries, and uh, we have the incidence around 600,000 people every year. And most of these people access the private sector as a first point of contact. A study shows that 86% of the people goes to the private sector as a first point of contact and in pakistan the private sector is highly unregulated so engaging the private sector which is highly unregulated is very challenging and uh, we started uh, this with the support of his pakistan and university of oslo and bill and melinda gates foundation next slide so how we started we set up an aggregate instance uh, for the tb control program in pakistan uh, we started recording the case notification reports as well as treatment outcome reports and these reports have a dashboard which uh, shows the trends and analysis of the case notification and the treatment outcome of the country. Next slide. But uh, this this was not enough actually uh, because as the, uh, Mr. Kazi has mentioned that there are a lot of uh, patients who are missed in the private sector uh, who are also missed in the public sector but some people they access the private sector and they also access the public sector so lack of intelligent data and surveillance was uh, uh, missing uh, reliance on paper based system uh, which has its own limitation and uh, there was no insight on what is happening in the field monitoring was not there we didn't know that these patients what kind of drug resistance profile they have. Uh, we didn't know about their trends, uh, what, what are the trends, what are the seasonality trends and et cetera. And uh, we were not 
actually allocating resources based on the data which you're receiving. Next slide. So we set up the tracker uh, in the private sector and we used the, the support of call center uh, to set up the tracker and get the notification from the field. So the, the, the system which we are using in the private sector has step number one, when the patient visits the GP in the field, the GP notifies the patient to a call center and the call center gets the information, some basic information about the patient. And then the district field supervisors who are working with us in the private sector, they visit the patient, get the more detailed information and enter the system in the system, uh, enter the information in the system. So in this way, the data is available in the cloud, in the DHIS2 uh, software. Uh, and this data can be accessed by the uh, government authorities, the district health authorities and the private sector as well. Next slide. But the private sector is not only limited to the case notification. We are also doing the active case finding in the country. And by active case finding is the most expensive intervention which is done by the private sector. So we digitalize our, our active case finding intervention as well. We develop an app which can help support collecting the data in the field in the remote setting where there is no internet facility available, but the system is there to collect the information of the individuals who are screened. And then this information is used to analyze the trends uh, in the communities, in the fields, so that the future active case finding activities can be planned. And uh, using the dashboards, which are uh, generated by DHIS2, uh, it really helps us to target the areas where the active case finding in, uh, in, uh, activities can be directed. Next slide. We, also, we are also engaging the pharmacies and uh, engaging a pharmacies uh, who are working for business in the communities is also another challenge. So what we do is actually, we trained the pharmacy staff uh, in the field and provided them with an application. And that applications require them to only upload the prescription of TB patients who can come to the, who visit them to collect the information from them. So in this way, the, uh, these uh, prescriptions are received by the National TB Control Program and their private partners, and then they mobilize their field staff to contact them and offer them the free of cost services and the whole program package to them. So this is helping helping us increasing our network. So this information, which was basically collected by the private sector, the private pharmacies, is now also available to the public sector as well for decision making. Next slide. In addition to this, we were also connecting the communities with the diagnostic facilities. And how we were doing it? Actually, we set up an Uber kind of uh, Uber based kind of application in which the samples are transported. Uh, using an application. There are volunteer riders in the communities who use this application. They uh, get the jobs. Uh, for example, if there is a need to sample, uh, to transport the sample from one clinic to the diagnostic facility, they post a job on an application. The volunteer rider gets the job and then upload this uh, and, and uh, goes to the center, collect the specimen and transport it to the diagnostic center. And this way, we are expanding our diagnostic network to those people who do not have access to laboratories. Next slide. Now, having all this information in different systems, which were not speaking to each other before, we are using the common system, which is DHIS2. And all this information is coming in to the DHIS2 server. So in this way, all this information is analyzed in the real-time fashion and program is uh, notified or informed about the timely decision making. Next slide. Next. Now, as I mentioned uh, in the previous slides, we are not only collecting this information and storing this information in our databases. We want to use this information because Pakistan is one of the high burden countries and missing a lot of uh, people uh, cases in the community. So we want to use this information so that we can reach to these people. And, and use this information to get uh, provide them access to the quality care and diagnosis. So this information, which is coming in from the DHIS2 tracker capture and information coming in from the other sources, other software, which the private sector is using, we are feeding this information to a model, uh, which is artificial intelligence-based model and uh, using, uh, using a Bayesian model to analyze this information and generate the trends 
Next slide. So the model which we have set up in Pakistan is a Bayesian model, artificial intelligence based model, which predicts the hotspots in the communities. So in the smaller communities, it can tell you where there is high prevalence of TB patients. And then the program can direct their resources to these areas where they are much needed. We, uh, we are directing our active case finding inter, uh, intervention uh, activities to these areas. We are engaging more pharmacies in these areas and we are engaging more GPs in these, years, in these areas to expand our coverage and uh, get more people into our network. Uh, so that's how the DHIS2 is helping us in the private sector to not only collect the information from the field, but also efficiently use this information for effective program implementation. With this, I thank you very much. Yes, no, we can have a round of question if someone wants to ask anything. Nothing? Good. Everything understood? We tried that no one, none of you sleeps, but yes, please. So, sorry, maybe I was. I mean, the, the difference between the structure of the job is very well. Even the organization looks like they are really quite effective. I don't know from the start how uh, did you manage to really engage them, the private sector, concretely, I mean, just apart from the IT tools that you are set up. How did you manage to really engage them? What are their benefits in that so that they really got engaged and started uh, all this information for the same level? Is there any national policies that will take it better? I mean, I just want to get more insight from your side because it's not about all the tools. The tools are there to support processes. So what really was the change maker or really the big pressure to change it and make it and make them involved in the process. Yes, good question. Yes, as I said, technical stuff is already there. Solutions are there, but it's when it, it is hard when it comes to managerial problems. Uh, but uh, I think uh, it started back in uh, 2018, where they have this National Digital Health Strategy, 2018 to 2024, where it was decided to continue with the DHIS2 as a system for the health data collection. And the, the same, same time, they, they agreed to uh, bring private sector on board by, because as you mentioned, most of the uh, treatment, 60, 60 or 65% of the population are going towards our private sector, which means that we do not have more than half of the data. So no, uh, we have less, more than less, more than less than 50% of the data, which makes your decision nearly incorrect so that was the uh, like motive behind combining the private sector though they can have governance and coverage to as many as much data as possible so that decision making can be uh move forward and this was actually uh driven by our uh, ministry as well and it was like back in 2018 where they have uh agreed this mous and everything I would yes please uh, for, uh, for the next question, can you wait for the mic? I can. Okay. I can. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, adding to what Zubair has already mentioned, so in Pakistan. I will share the experience of Pakistan. In Pakistan, there is a mandatory TB notification act, which has been passed by three out of four provinces. So the GPs or the private practitioners who are working in the private sector, by law, they are required to notify the case to the district health authorities. So this is a very strong document we have in hand uh, to uh, convince them to get on board with the program. Plus, I mean, by getting them, on, uh, we tell them about the advantages to get on board with the program and the advantages is, are that they get the free diagnostic services. So for example, if, if a TB patient comes to them and if, if the patient gets a free diagnosis, then that's the a, that's a positive advocacy uh, done for that GP or the private practitioner who has been practicing in the field. So they spread a good word in the community that this doctor is doing a test for TB, which is free of cost. Then the drugs are provided free of cost. And then the follow-ups are done. Uh, uh, free of cost because they are getting incentive from us as a program 
uh, for the services which they are providing to the patients. And secondly, I mean, in Pakistan, uh, there is a lot of control on the anti-TB drugs sale in the market now because uh, the Global Fund has been providing a lot of drugs uh, to the country and the communities are using these drugs. Uh, I mean, uh, the GPs, that the uh, because we have engaged more than 14,000 GPs in the country. So those main GPs who are prescribing the anti-TB drugs are now with the program. So the sale of anti-TB drugs is very less. So if if a, a GP or a private hospital wants to treat a TB patient, it's better for them to engage with the program uh, and uh, treat these patients rather than treating them on their own. So these are different kinds of strategies which we are using in Pakistan and it, it, is, it is successful so far. The only challenge which we are facing is the comprehensive recording and reporting tools which are used by the TB control program in Pakistan. Uh, but we have a very strong field force which are basically supporting these private uh, practitioners uh, to fill this recording reporting tool. And as Zubair has mentioned that since 2018, this digital system has helped us a lot in uh, uh, getting the information from the field by digitally entering because previously it was inter they were using the paper-based system. And this call center is now helping them to get the notification on calls only. I hope I have answered your question. Yes. So thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, my name is Farshad Farzadfar. I am scientist in NCD department, WHO headquarter, Geneva. I have uh, two questions. One is for colleagues in the Sri Lanka and Pakistan both. Uh, have you done any data quality review on the what you are receiving from private sector? And the second uh, part of the question regarding the uh, colleagues in Pakistan is uh, uh, how um, uh, what what type of data you are uh, collecting from the pharmacies? Actually, the the question is uh, uh, what is that is about the name of medicines, doses that they are using, or is just general information that they are receiving the medications? Thank you. So I suppose your first question is with uh, Dr. Uh, is Dr. Zhang here. Yes, yeah. uh, regarding the question uh, pertaining to data quality. Yes, uh, actually uh, what you're doing is like uh, we are obtaining uh, data from the private sector at the same time. Uh, once they input the data, um, we are assessing um, the data inputs. So, uh, so in the system, what we have done is uh, we have... Uh, inputted some uh, validation rules so um, if they uh, try to input uh, data which is um, uh, say uh, say the mother's uh, period of amenorrhea so if the period of amenorrhea is uh, having more than uh, two dig digits like say 100 so some uh, the data entry officers may not be aware of what they're entering. So in the system, it will just recognize as like uh, three digits and it will reduce to two digits, but uh, it won't exceed a certain amount, uh, which is the maximum limit for a POA. So uh, that so with the validation rules, we have uh, controlled that. Um, so when it comes to timeliness, uh, accuracy um, so the timeliness wise uh, we are assessing the reporting rate so they are um, told to enter the data um, uh, at the end of uh, each month at uh, um, 28th of each month so um, they are entering the data on time uh, so um, when it comes to accuracy uh, the data accuracy is like uh, say uh, say we are uh, capturing the uh, number of newborn children and um, um, the weight of the child and the sex. So um, the, well, when you get the feedback from their side, as I mentioned in the slide, um, it tallies with uh, what we have. So um, it in the end, it comes as um, all comes as aggregate data. And uh, then we compile it. And uh, um, the end result will be um, the data which we use. 
uh, which is uh, uh, collected and uh, we uh, use those data for action for the national program for mental and child health. Uh, I hope that uh, answered your question. Yeah, actually, well, I wanted to be more focused on the collected data, not the validity uh, yes. for data, recording uh, recorded data. Well, what what you have done when you receive the amounts of the information from the private sector? How do you know that this data are reliable and valid when you have uh, when uh, then you can you can do the planning for this part. Yes, yes. Um, so um, um, when it comes to collecting the data from the private sector, um, what we do is uh, we uh, perform training programs. So uh, if there's any questions um, uh, pertaining to uh, entering the data, we cross-check uh, with them personally, like we can call them or we have a WhatsApp group and Viber. Uh, if there are any questions uh, they have, uh, we uh, discuss in collaboration with the private sector um, and uh, we have like a, a, a manual sheet which we use to collect data so uh, we uh, use that so um, whatever the um, information they are sending us um, we uh, get a feedback um, from them uh, using uh, the data Should we move on to your next question? That was related to something. Uh, sorry, can, can you repeat your next, second question? Uh, la, the second question was about the information that you are collecting from pharmacy. What are the uh, what are the type of the information that you are collecting? So uh, just to briefly answer uh, related to your first question, we have the same uh, kind of data validation mechanism in Pakistan for both public and private sector. So there are call it qu uh, quarterly review meetings in which the data is being presented to the district health authorities where it is reviewed. These activities are funded by the global fund. So uh, the private sector brings in the patient record files with them and it has been validated by the district health authority. So uh, regarding your second question for pharmacy pr related uh, project, uh, uh, the pharmacies basically just notify the prescriptions uh, after taking the consent from the patient, of course, upload the prescription in an application. And that prescription contains the information about the patient name, their telephone number, uh, the uh, information related to the GP who has been treating the patient, and the CNIC number. Its CNIC number is the unique identifier number given uh, to them by the government of Pakistan. It's the national identity card number. So this information is provided to the program. Uh, the district then our field staff is mobilized to contact them, offer them uh, the free services, and get the detailed information about their details of uh, diagnosis, for example, on what test they were diagnosed, what kind of treatment they are getting, and etc. So this information is then collected by our field staff. But the pharmacy is only upload the prescription. They take the photo uh, from their phone and upload it in the application. Uh, I've been repeatedly asked for this group photo. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, is there any question? If not, okay. Yeah, please, uh, on the offline session, we have it. So please uh, move forward towards the, I don't know where exactly that is. Outside, yeah. 